Um, good morning, welcome to this week's Natural Gardening Live. And today we are talking about disease damage prevention. So, hope you're all all right. I have just whacked my knee as I started. So, excuse me, I'm wincing there as I started the live. Ouch, it's fine, I'll go for it. So disease can be one of the biggest challenges to gardeners, to gardens in general. Um, so if there's a way of reducing this challenge for us, then all the better. Um, yeah, makes our lives much easier and much happier and our gardens much e much happier as well. Happier and healthier. So today I've got five tips to help you prevent disease, disease damage, get the better of your garden and to help you manage it naturally. If you've had any issues with diseases in your garden, tell us in the comments. How did you, how did you manage it? How did you, what treatments did you use? How did you get over it? And have you eradicated it from your garden? Have you seen it since? Or does it come back year after year? So yeah, be interesting to know. Um, yeah, keep posting your comments as you go through and I'll pick those up through the day. Cool. Right, now that housekeeping's done. Find my notes. So, let's crack on with the tips. So five tips to help you prevent disease damage getting the better of your garden and to help you manage it naturally. So hopefully these tips will come in handy for you um, if you are struggling with disease in your garden or if you haven't really, if it's your the first year you've sort of done stuff in your garden, you haven't really noticed anything in the past, but yeah, hopefully these will be able to help you to manage them naturally. So number one, keep your tools clean. Keep them in clean, keep your tools clean and in good working order. It's all right, I do know what I'm talking about. My teeth are in. So keep your tools clean and in good condition, good working order. Now this can be for many reasons. One of which, which I've spoken about before, is the bacteria and dirt that can attach itself to your tools. Um, that is a breeding ground for disease. I'm gonna say bacteria on its own, fungal disease, anything like that, um, it's a breeding ground. So every time you use a dirty tool, potentially if you're pruning a plant with a dirty tool, with a dirty persecutors or pruners or loppers, anything like that, even hedge cutters, um, if they're dirty, they've got the disease on them already, you're gonna move them from plant to plant. It's the quickest way and the most common way that disease gets pushed through your garden and it spreads it like wildfire. Because obviously we, when we go out to prune, <clears throat> we don't just do like, I do one plant today, I do another plant tomorrow. That's, we usually do it in one foul swoop. So it's the quickest way that it will actually spread through your garden. So by keeping your tools clean and in good condition, you'll prevent that straight away. You'll clean off any of the um, like organic, the sap or the dirt or anything that sticks to the blades of your secateurs or your trowel, anything like that. And if you clean these off each time, then you're going to be removing the medium that the bacteria can live in, killing off anything that's living on there. Simple. Um, another thing of keep, keeping your tools in good condition is say sharpening your blades. Keeping a blade sharp, if I put this to cutting with a blunt knife, that's a good example. Cutting with a blunt knife. We know that when we try and cut things in the kitchen, like um, preparing food with a blunt knife, it's next to impossible, it's rubbish. And um, if you're cutting with a pair of scissors that's blunt, cutting paper, it doesn't make a very clean cut. If you try and cut a plant with a blunt pair of secateurs, you're more likely to squash the stem and not, um, it won't be a very clean and yeah, clean cut, really, clean, smooth cut. A clean cut is fast, will heal faster, um, will not leave the plant vulnerable to disease and um, infection. Whereas a damaged cut, if you crush the stem, you're going to, one, you're going to attract in the pests that will eat the sap, will live off the sap from the plant, um, encouraging in disease and infection straight away. Um, the natural air particles will come and anything bacterial or fungal that's in the air will attach to it. Um, it won't heal so fast, if at all, if it's infected. So, and that's all from just using a blunt secateur. So, but if you're using clean and sharp tools, this will not happen. So that's a really good way of preventing disease damage in your garden and damage full stop in your garden. Keep your tools in clean, good working order. It's also comfortable as well. If you've got a good, good clean secateurs to use, they're smoother, they work nicer. So say the blade's sharp, it's just all nice all round. So keep them clean and keep the blades sharp. Number two, now pruning and vigilance, I've named it, but it's mainly vigilance really, um, and pruning as a sidebar. When you're looking around your garden, maybe in like a spring morning, when you're a cup of tea, mitch around your garden and looking at all the new growth, new flowers and all sorts, you can see when something's out of place. 
Now you can do this in the winter as well, because there's a lot less leaves about to kind of hide anything, to camouflage, um, and you can notice any issues much clearer. You should have been cutting back anyway, so there'll be a le less material there to get got by any fungal or diseases, fungal issues. But in the spring and summer, when you're looking through and you're um, being vigilant in your garden, <laughs> sounds like crime stoppers, doesn't it? Be vigilant in your neighbourhood. Um, no, when you're when you're looking around your garden, you're noticing any issues that come up. You want to you want to catch the, the diseases early. So by looking at your garden every day, you are more likely to see when something's out of place. So when you see the first sign of black spot on your roses, or the first little hairs of grain mould that's appearing on like your um, busy lizzies um, or anything like that or pansies you notice these things sooner because you look at your garden every day now for some people this might not be too practical but if you try and get out you know five minutes just have a quick scout round to garden it helps you get to know it all and see it all so this will really help you get on top of the, the diseases or fungal issues or any issues in general really weeding as well it's really good for that but it'll help you get on top of that much quicker as I say the sooner you see the problems and you can remove them from the plants i'll get into the pruning bit in a second so as soon as you can get the problem sorted the um, less chance it's got of getting hold of the entire plant if you nip it off and it's just a leaf or um, a little section of stem you can prune it out quite quickly not causing too much trouble now if you need to prune the whole plant yeah so if you're if it's more than just the leaf and you need to prune it out completely then you need to prune it to the near, nearest clean bit of material. So not just like a few centimetres from where the mould stops, you need to, to the nearest bud cleanly, and then that will prevent the disease from spreading. That should nip it in the bud quite nicely. But yeah, the, the more vigilant you are with it, the quicker you're gonna catch this, the easier it will be to prune it out. Saving the entire plant. Now I've had issues in the past, so I've had to remove the entire plant from the garden, hoping naively that the plant will recover, but they don't. Unfortunately, you've really got to be blunt with it sometimes. That's bad, blunt. But you know, you've really got to be like realistic. If this plant's got more disease in it than you can prune out. By removing it from the garden, you're going to stop the spread of the disease and it's really going to make so much of a difference. If you leave it there because you're sentimental about it, then the chances are you're going to cause more damage to your garden than you are to save the plant. You can try and, I have done this in the past, I've potted up the plant up particularly on its own in a pot and put it in the greenhouse and I've pruned it to like the nth degree to try and save it. Um, it they sometimes survive for a few more months but generally speaking it's really it's a struggle for them and I haven't saved a plant <laughs> when it got that bad I haven't managed to keep one going so yeah it's just something you've got to live with I think unfortunately it happens. Number three um, <laughs> drainage and watering routines now we all know damp leads to mold. If you've got a house that has got um, like damp in the walls or if you're in a particularly damp area, if you're in an old house that isn't very well insulated, you're gonna get damp on the walls. It's just like, it's, it happens. Um, mold and bacteria, disease in general really, likes damp ground. They like it, they like damp, cold, manky areas. If you make sure that your soil is free draining, is good condition and yeah, and it doesn't waterlog easily. If you've got clay soil, you're in a bit of a sticky wicky on that one. But the more you condition it, the more you um, loosen it up, the better it will be. But also making sure that your containers have got good drainage. And I think I mentioned this on the live a few weeks ago. Make sure your containers have got good drainage. Put them up on feet if needs be, um, so that the water can drain through. If they haven't got drainage holes, when you come to replant them, either make drainage holes in them, or um, the good tip that I had was plant the plant in a pot, flower pot, like a non-plastic flower pot, and then um, put it inside the container. If you still want to use the container as the outer, put the plant pot in the container um, so you can see it so it hides it. And then you've got the flower pot with the drainage, and then you can just lift the plant out, tip the water out of the nice pot, put the kind of flower pot back in and you're fine. You haven't got to worry about the soil getting watered up because it's good drainage. So make sure that your ground has got good drainage and to prevent any, any dampness, if you like encouraging um, bacteria and fungal diseases to take hold. Um, also watering routine. If you water in the mornings, um, particularly in the summertime, this is particularly good, but if you water in the mornings, um, 
the soil can take up, the plants can take up the moisture quicker and um, it drains away nicely. But if you water in the evenings, it's got all night to sort of sit there. Um, if you water midday, it's bad anyway, because you can burn the leaves, especially in the summer. You can burn the leaves, the sunshine burns the leaves, and um, evaporates faster and the plants can take it up. So it's going to be no use to anybody. But yeah, managing your watering routine and watering at the right time of day, that really does help as well. Um, we are number four. So this is a kind of a did you know. Did you know you can buy disease resistant plants? I know, it's amazing, isn't it? No, <laughs> these have been around for a long time and they really do make a difference if you've got particular issues in your garden. Um, so you can buy the plants from garden centres, nurseries, you can buy them online if you haven't got one near you. Um, you can buy the seeds as well, so you can grow the seeds, to make, which is much more cost effective if you've got the facilities to grow seeds, grow from seed. But if you have particular issues, especially in vegetable patches, um, if you've got a particular issue with um, a persistent fungal issue such as blight which we actually had a problem with this year for the first time ever which I was very annoyed about so that's life I suppose um, if you have any particular issue you can actually buy plants that are, um, are disease resistant is it resistant to blight and they'll generally speaking they won't be resistant to every disease under the sun they'll only be resistant to the diseases that mainly affect that plant so as I say like you can get blight resistant tomato plants or potatoes and um, seed potatoes so that is a really good way of managing persistent diseases in your garden and eradicating them as well eventually from your from the soil um, now diseases can live in the soil for a good decade or two sometimes but if they haven't got the plants to um continue their life cycle if you like i don't think diseases have kind of got a life cycle like plant seeds and things but yeah continuing their life cycle to keep spreading fungal spores or whatever um then that will drastically remove or reduce the time that they can live in the soil for. So, if you've got a problem, buy disease resistant plants or seeds. That'll really help. Another good one for your vegetable patch, this isn't in the five tips, but it's just a little added extra for you, um, it's crop rotation. Now, in your vegetable patch, if you plant the same crops or the same family of crops in the same patch of soil year after year after year after year, um, you are increasing the chance of disease buildup in that patch of soil. So if you plant, um, so brassicas like cabbages and cauliflower and broccoli in the same patch every year, then the chances of you getting, of your, of you, no, of your garden, of that patch of soil picking up having club root or, um, I can't even any other diseases that affect cabbages at the moment, but yeah, um, that will, that will increase drastically. So if you rotate the crops, so if you make a plan of what you're planting one year, what vegetables you're planting where and then the next year you don't plant the same vegetables in those places you're going to straight away um, like reduce down the amount the risk of disease build up in that patch of soil so it's a very very good idea really it's a very good idea um, I've always crop rotated anyway just for a matter of I can never decide on what grows best where so and when I add new vegetables in they always grow best in a different place so then I have to rotate everything to move it so that one new vegetable will grow happily so I generally speaking I accidentally crop rotate every year but yeah so I'm, I've never had a disease issue in my vegetable patch until this year when I got blind I don't generally grow my tomatoes outside until this year and I won't be doing it again they always run the greenhouse quite happily never had light and this year i grew some outside and they got light so that won't be happening again my potatoes didn't though which was good considering they should usually if tomatoes do your potatoes well so that's <laughs> neither here nor there i suppose but no tomatoes outside next year I'm telling you that for nothing what was that one four number five this kind of goes with number two kind of um, when you're, when you see, when you're vigilant and you see the fungal diseases appear, you need to try, you need to treat fast. You need to treat as fast as you possibly can. As soon as you see any signs of anything vaguely fungal or, um, disease related, anything like that, any spots on the leaves, any discolorations, anything like that, you need to treat with something as soon as possible. Whether it's pruning, like I said in number two, or whether it's, um, a various like natural treatments, or if you're not natural. If you're not natural, treat it with something as soon as you can, because the quicker you get there, the quicker you can resolve the any issues that you've got there, and 
stop it getting hold of the entire plant. Now I touched on this in the first one, but I've got a few natural treatments as well for number five that I know work, whether I've used them myself or I've known people that have used them and they've said categorically that they've worked. So I've got a few here for you that would hopefully help. But I've also got a playlist which has got the natural feeds and treatments and I've got some anti, um, some fungal anti-disease treatments in there as well, natural ones. So I'll talk you through these, but check that out. So we have got, so bicarb. Now bicarb's a good mixer, if you like. So we've got bicarb, uh, rubbing alcohol, Epsom salts, soap and water. Now these all individually aren't gonna do much for the garden, rubbing alcohol might, but it might also damage plants. But mixed together, not all of them mixed together, but in various recipes, you can make some really effective um, disease measures, disease controls, all natural. So bicarb, the one I've done on the video as well, is bicarb soap and water. Now I've used a bicarb with just normal hand soap, the cheapest hand soap you can get. No moisturizers involved, no perfumes. Um, you wanna just have it as plain and cheap as possible. But it has to be liquid soap, not the like bar soap or soda or whatever, like that. It needs to be like the really cheap hand soap. You can buy it for like 50p from Tesco's, like a litre, just pump, you know. Um, but bicarb soap and water, that works very effectively against, I've used it on powdery mildew and it's worked very well. Um, you have to use these treatments more than once. It's not like you can get a chemical one that generally you use like twice and it's gone. Um, you have to use these every couple of weeks until it's actually, the disease has passed, it's gone. So ideally prune it whatever you can first and then give it a spray and then keep an eye on it and then spray it again and then keep an eye on it. That's generally the best way of doing it, but it's natural. So it's gonna take a bit more effort behind, but you're gonna get less side effects, which we like. So that's uh, the rubbing alcohol and Epsom salts are the same. So you can use rubbing alcohol, soap and water, um, soap and bicarb. That works really well. We all know rubbing alcohol or alcohol in general, anything over 60% alcohol, 65% alcohol will kill disease. Um, we know this from the general COVID situation and um, hand gel. Um, rubbing alcohol for plants is no different, but you can't directly apply rubbing alcohol to a plant because that will kill the leaves. It will kill the plant effectively. So by mixing with water, with <laughs> mixing with soap and mixing with bicarb, you will then create a really effective um, spray or you can use it as a paste if you've got something quite woody um, to then kill off any fungal issues or any bacterial issues and disease issues in general, really. They're very effective. Same with Epsom salts. Um, you can use Epsom salt soap and water. Epsom salts and alcohol and soap as well. They make very effective and disease treatments. As I say, I've done the videos on a few, so you can kind of have the idea. Um, cinnamon. Cinnamon is a very effective antifungal treatment, um, natural antifungal treatment. It can be a bit pricey, because cinnamon can be quite expensive sometimes. Depends where you buy it from and how much. And if you, for container indoor container plants, you can use this in outdoor container plants, but it lasts longer inside because it's cinnamon and it washes away with the water, with like rain or air or anything like that. So um, have a thick layer of cinnamon over the soil and then over time that that will kill off any, quite quickly actually, kill off any fungal spores that are in the soil. Now, because it washes away, because it dissolves into the soil, you do have to retreat. For fungus gnats, this is really good because it kills off the fungus that the gnats feed on then preventing the gnats at all because they won't want to either go to the plant to eat the fungus or they won't want to lay their eggs in the soil to hatch out because the fungus is there. So a thick layer of cinnamon over the top of the soil and then that will sort out any issues with the fungus gnats or any fungal issues in your houseplant soil. Very good. But yeah, I haven't found a spray yet that I can use mixed cinnamon in. I'm going to have to look for that. Dead nettle tea. Dead nettles avid weed in the garden, but fantastic um, antifungal, anti-disease treatment for the garden. Really good. Done a video on that as well, and that should be in that playlist. So have a look out for that. And the last but not least for these natural treatments is neem oil. Now neem oil is made from the seeds of the neem tree. Sounds like something out of Dr. Seuss, doesn't it? The neem tree. Um, I've never used neem oil myself, but I know people that have, and that they've said categorically that it worked for them but I can't say myself if it's worked because I've never used it. So they've used that on its own as a um, diluted down as a spray. They've also mixed it with soap and water and I think 
have to look for some methods on how to do it, put it together, because I've, I've never done it myself. So, but I think you can dilute it with other things as well to make it. But you can get that in garden centres, you can get that online. I know Amazon sells it because I've seen it on there. Um, but yeah, you can get it anywhere. But neem oil, apparently a very effective uh, disease and antifungal treatment. But I know it's very good for a natural pest control method as well. So treat as fast as you can is a really good starting point. When you, as soon as you see an issue, get to it, whether you're pruning it out, um, spraying it with something, um, or removing the whole plant. If you're wor that worried about where it is in relation to other plants, remove the whole plant. Hopefully you can get to it before you have to do that because it's heartbreaking when you have to remove a plant from the garden. I hate it. But yeah, that's, that's how it is sometimes. Unfortunately, you just have to live with it. So I hope you enjoyed today. And if you've got any questions, keep posting and I'll pick them up through the day. But for now, I will see you later. La, 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 la,